derelict. It is the fashion, a way of life inspired by the very homeless, the vagrants, the, the crack whores that make this wonderful city so unique. I recently came across an article called The Troubling Trendiness of Poverty Appropriation by July Westhale. At first, I was quick to dismiss poverty appropriation as yet another woke term, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized there is some truth to it. The glamorization of poor culture can be seen across many industries. John Galliano's Haute Couture collection of 2000 for Dior was inspired by the homeless people of France. The clothes were torn, had exposed labels, were accessorized with whiskey bottles, tin cups, bottle caps and safety pins. Kanye West's Yeezy fashion line also seems to glamorize looking poor. Other examples are luxury meals that were once a poor person's food like lobsters. They were served to prisoners, used as fish bait and even as fertilizer for crops. They were given the nickname Cockroaches of the Sea. But with some clever marketing in the 1800s, their prices soared and they became a delicacy instead of a nuisance. Red lobster for live Maine lobster, just the way you like it. Quinoa, the poster child for healthy diets and the superfood movement, was relegated to the ultra-poor in the past. Wealthy Peruvians didn't want to be seen eating it, but again, with some strategic marketing tactics, they became trendy and expensive. In fact, the price of quinoa tripled from 2006 to 2013 when North America and Europe discovered the superfood. This poverty appropriation is also evident in the construction and housing industry. Composting toilets in developing countries are considered to be repulsive, but in a developed country, they are environmentally friendly. Hong Kong is one of the most expensive cities in the world, so space is precious. The city has minuscule apartments called coffin homes because they measure just 2 feet by 6 feet. People who have no other living alternatives cram all their belongings into this tiny, claustrophobic box that is bound to cause extreme psychological, emotional, mental and physical trauma. You can barely lay flat in these spaces. Now let's slap some white paint on it, increase the price per square foot by tenfold, sell it as a multifunctional alternative lifestyle and voila, they're a design marvel and source of envy. There's even a YouTube channel called Never Too Small with over a million subscribers that showcase these tiny spaces, including this 150 square foot luxurious micro apartment. They obviously have advantages over the coffin homes like access to daylight, higher end finishes, etc. But it's still glamorization of small living. Using words like tiny and micro are distractions and marketing ploys. I made a video on super adobe earth pack homes last week, which could be considered poverty appropriation and glamorization if they are sold as a travel experience for the wealthy. Earthbag homes are based on the ancient building method of adobe housing and are still built in developing and underdeveloped countries around the world, where they don't have an alternative building method. But in the Western world, they have been marketed as a communal building experience, a return to the basics, an environmentally sustainable house. It's romanticizing a primitive, poor person construction method. Okay, before you jump on the comments, I should say that I don't think that earthbag home construction or tiny homes in general are intentionally trying to hurt lower end communities or glamorize poverty for that matter. If you want to build and live in a tiny home, it's all good. However, it is important to be aware of this phenomenon and check ourselves the next time we make fun of people living in trailer parks and call them trash while praising people who live in tiny homes. The tiny house movement which grew popular in the 90s is an architectural and social movement that advocates living simply in smaller homes. They are typically under 400 square feet or 37 square meters. They were extremely popular after the Great Recession in 2008 when families lost their jobs and were displaced. These houses offered an affordable, ecologically friendly housing option. Nowadays, soaring housing costs keep these homes in demand. Shows on HGTV, YouTube channels and the advent of social media all contributed to their glamorization as well. 
a tiny home can cost around $400 per square foot, while a mobile home can be just $40 per square foot, but people feel like the cost is justified. Tiny home living only glamorizes a very specific type of house, so people are willing to shell out money for it. Any other more established options like trailers or fifth wheels aren't cool. Social media in particular has allowed people to make a self-sustaining career out of building and living in a tiny home, converting vans and buses and traveling all across the country. Since people can now work remotely, they are not tied to a single location and they don't have to buy an expensive house in a city. Valuing experiences over possessions is pushed across all forms of media and I have bought into that philosophy too. I consider myself a minimalist, but to other family members, I'm just frugal. I've noticed that humans tend to want things that they don't or they can't have. It's part of that grass is greener on the other side mentality. I grew up in a small two-bedroom apartment in Dubai, and back in the 90s, expatriates couldn't own their own house. So I bought into the dream of owning a house with a yard and a fence when I came to the States. First-generation immigrants who have lived in tiny homes or apartments in their native countries will want space and a backyard, things that they consider to be luxurious. On the other hand, people who have already lived the lifestyle want to give it up because they feel home ownership ties them down, it's a burden, and it doesn't bring them any joy. A life free of possessions is appealing to them because it's different. Simplicity is good for the soul. Your soul is as empty as this house. This house. This house. So to summarize, I don't think that tiny home living is intentional poverty appropriation, and I don't think it's trying to hurt a particular demographic. There is nothing wrong with either living in a tiny home or living in a big house. You need both lifestyles to keep the building and construction industry innovating and the economy as a whole growing. Think of all the jobs that were created because of this tiny home movement. Humans tend to get bored easily and innovating a different lifestyle and a different kind of home keeps us excited and occupied. We have to find inspiration from somewhere and in this case, it just so happens that it can be traced back to the poor. Let me know what you think about poverty appropriation in the comments below and if you have ideas for other topics that I could discuss. My channel just crossed 20,000 subscribers so thanks a lot for that. I really appreciate it. Anyway, uh, that's all for now. See ya. Damn.